All right. Let's do it. Trace, dos, uno. Uh... Recording in progress. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Assuming that this is all one continuous video. Uh, but if you are watching it in sections or you jumped to the postscript, then what we are doing is reading Andre Gorz's Farewell to the Working Class, which was originally Farewell to the Proletariat. It was mistranslated. That's a really important point that we got from our conversation with Daniel Tutt earlier today. Uh, yesterday, we read the entirety of Farewell to the Working Class, including its preface, except for this postscript. And in a second, we'll jump into it. But we do want to say a couple things about this, the fact that we are doing this postscript right after having had our conversation with Daniel Tut. I do want to encourage people to go check out the entirety of that conversation, especially if you are really interested in this text and how it has been received and how he is being, Gores, is being associated with the new left and many of its pitfalls. Yeah, so what do you, what do we want to say there about the conversation with Tut and uh, Gores? I think, first of all, it was, great conversation i do really like daniel tut every time uh we get a chance or i get a chance to interact with him I, I love it he's a great guy however the conversation kind of went as we had predicted it would go where um this text and even gores wasn't really the subject of the conversation it, it was um the new left and it was the anti-work movement and it and it was some of these other tendencies that I think all of us agree on, like we agree, we identify them, we agree that they're problems, we agree that they're dead ends, all these things. Like there was, I feel like there was a lot more agreement than, um, than maybe might, uh, it might have appeared at first glance. And I also think um, that if Tut had the time, and I, I mean, he doesn't have the time, so I'm not going to expect him to but it, i do think if he had the time to actually go through this this text and and some of the background we've done he would probably um make a lot more concessions than um than he might be inclined and i and i get that i i appreciate his position i i do understand what he's trying to stick up for and and he is trying to prevent a backslide in, into some identitarian shit and like i i fully get all of that but I just like he um he's not engaging with with Gorse himself and and that's that's fine. I He did pull quote. He did at a point. He and did I appreciated that. Yeah. And and actually the quote he used, um, and I don't know the page numbers and sections and all that right now, but that, that quote he used from eighty when he did yeah, that. That quote he used Part of it surfaces later when he is talking about autonomous activity and the moral or the question of morality. And so when Gores is kind of reiterating part of that, um, it emphasizes this Arentian view of morality, which I love. And maybe that's coloring my opinion because he, he also does talk about this, the necessity or it, it does sound like he's positing this revolutionary non-class. Touch right about that. And I, like, I accept his criticism, but also, like, I feel like the louder part of Gores' sentiment is this view on Arentian morality and how we can incorporate that back into agency and interconnectivity and shit like that. I just, I feel like there's a lot more going on i feel like gores is doing much more than just um well yeah it's not just it's never just right right but it was and a great conversation a great but uh, great conversation so there was a lot of ju of justing of he's just this he's just that he's participating in this he's participating in that um 
like if we reduce Marx's whole project into the dictator we don't like, it's like, oh, well, he's just, he's just, he's just. Um, and I love this direction Tut is going with his critique of the new left. I think that he is touching on major tendencies, which is like, you know, the tendency towards, oh, well, there's no point taking power. It'll, you'll just be corrupted. Uh, leadership is bad. Horizontalism is good. Uh, workers are reactionary. We just need to organize the lumpen proles. Like those kind of like key uh, ideas. And also this idea that the margins, the marginalized uh, are necessarily like the more like, oh, that's a revolutionary subject or whatever. That's a new revolutionary subject. Um, all of that is stuff that is theoretically um, problematic in a lot of ways. And in a lot of ways, not just dead ends, but actually perfect for co-opting into a sort of, um, whether it's neoliberal or social democratic, PMC, end of history, nothing will ever change, has no chance of challenging capital, but nothing that we've done in this reading leads me to the conclusion that Gortz is actually um, symptomatic of any of that. All of that is symptomatic of a real situation that Gortz is looking at, but he's looking beyond it. And uh, yeah, uh, I we told... We told Tut what we said earlier in this reading, which was that we'd love to actually just take turns reading it and have him respond paragraph at a time. His response was instead of saying that he doesn't have the time energy or that the restrictions on his, you know, that he just can't do it because it would be impossible with his current job and work-life balance. Instead, he just pivoted to saying that we're way into gores right now. And it's like, <laughs> like you guys really love gores you guys should get a a gores bobblehead for your the dash of your car and i'm like I'm, I'm about ready to get a gores tattoo on my fucking face yeah dude i love gores but come on uh no i think that there it's because there is something here i mean i love moish pistone uh i don't think moish pistone or gores is in any way shape or form reducible to the things i dislike the most about the new left i don't think in any way shape or form uh, that they are reducible to any way that they may have ever voted, any actual practical policy that they ever proposed. Um, and I think that that's the problem is whenever you have someone who's trying to take an, a, a sober assessment of the actual existing situation on the ground and why it poses a real problem for the old theories, the old class theories, um, people uh, take whatever you might do or be associated with as what it was all about in the first place when i would just say yeah like for instance uh you have a uh you think that revolutionary activity or action in the classical sense is not a way forward and so then you're voting for the lesser evil so then people say well then your analysis is reducible to that to that uh you, it's really a, a, an operationalized analysis all of it directed towards this outcome and it's like yeah but also voting for a lesser evil or being a social democrat doesn't mean that that's your the vision of the future that you hold you just don't have a future and so it's becoming this sort of like uh well mm, this is where we're at this is the only alternative and it's not even a real alternative right and so i think people like dr adolf reed jr um uh because you know Catron will bring him up as an example of this, or Mark Fisher, because Doug Lane will say that the limit of Mark Fisher's politics is Thatcherism, or no, sorry, uh, Corbynism. Nice slip. Um, what they're doing is a sort of like uh, reductionism of a person's analysis to the way that they vote or a policy they might've been for, or some people they might've associated with. It's almost like a guilt by association thing. Um, I just think that I don't give a fuck if you vote for Trump or Hillary. What I care about is your analysis of the current situation. And do you see, or are you looking for some way forward outside of the current deadlock? Yeah. So yeah, that's, I guess that's my main thing, but 
Go watch it for yourself, everybody. Let us know if you do. Yeah. And uh, um, hopefully it won't be too long before we could reconvene with, with Tut. Because, uh, yeah. He is reading Time Energy, and so I'd like to reconvene with him once he's read Time Energy and once we've had a chance to um, read the entirety of his Nietzsche book. But all right, let's get into this. So this is the postscript from Farewell to the Working Class, which is, properly speaking, the proletariat. That's an important distinction for us. It's not for a lot of people. A lot of people use the word proletariat in a very expansivist way that was not being used by Marx or Engels, when they said the proletariat, they meant industrial workers. They meant a very specific kind of industrial worker that they were seeing empirically on the ground that they also, if we were to take Gores at his word, and I think there's something to it, uh, was loaded with theological assumptions because it was a, a form of inverted Christianity, a form of inverted Hegelianism, and a form of inverted, what was the other tendency? Uh, scientism. Yeah. yeah. So destruction destructive growth and productive shrinking all right so this is i mean i think this is probably the part that really feeds into the stuff that you've been doing nance uh that you've been thinking a lot about did you ever get to it did you listen to this already or, or I, is this all going to be fresh territory this is so i i did a super quick listen at like two two point five x um so yeah it's all going to be okay pretty, pretty new. cool all right. What do we need? What do we desire? What do we lack in order to fulfill ourselves, to communicate with others, to lead more relaxed lives and establish more loving relations? Economic forecasting and political economy in general have nothing to offer here. Concerned as they are simply to keep the machines turning over, to keep capital circulating, or to maintain a certain level of employment, they manufacture the needs which correspond at any given moment to the requirements of the machinery of production and circulation. Oh my God, thank you. Yeah. Well, I also promise for that. Deliberately and systematically, they, su they supply us with new wants and new scarcities, new types of luxury and new senses of poverty in conformity with capital's need for profitability and growth. Capital has at its service a number of strategists who are capable of manipulating our most intimate desires in order to impose their products upon us by means of the symbols with which they are charged. 20 years ago, one such strategist spilled the beans with considerable candor. He was Stanley Rezor, president of J. Walter Thompson, one of the biggest advertising agencies in the USA. I love this quote. He said, when income goes up, the most important thing is to create new needs. If you ask people, do you know that your standard of living will go up by 50% in 10 years? They haven't got the faintest idea what that means. They don't realize that they need a second car unless they're carefully reminded. The need has to be created in their minds. They have to be brought to realize all the advantages of having a second car. I see advertising as an educational activating force capable of producing the changes in demand which we need. By educating people into higher living standards, it ensures that consumption will rise to a level justified by our productivity and resources. And I just want to say like a good example of this is that every time I've had to go to the bathroom when I am downstairs in this house that we just moved into, I think the bathroom's down there. And then I remember I actually have to run up the stairs because there's only one bathroom in this house. It's a thousand square feet upstairs, downstairs. Uh, normally, such uh, buildings nowadays have a bathroom downstairs, right? And so this one, usually it's like a half bath, they call it, because it doesn't have a bath or a shower. And the fact that I am used to that is because of that so-called need being reified by um, going into other people's houses, more modern houses. I've never lived in a house that had a bathroom upstairs and downstairs until I was in Mexico at an Airbnb. And so it's just like, it is like this luxury that we take for granted, but why do we take it for granted? It's because the real estate industry obviously benefits. It wants to tear down old houses, build new houses, sell them for 
10 times what we actually need, right? And then we're in debt for the rest of our lives. And so it's this is ultimately what Baudrillard is getting at in um, his critique of needs in the mirror of production or in, I mean, I think it's throughout his work, but um, that was something that we'd actually brought up with um, Tut because this, this, what we're reading right here is in Tut's mind, susceptible of uh, being uh, feeding into degrowth narratives and ideology and yeah yeah I, I think that is a very uh i mean it it is possible that that could lead to that but I, that's a very simple read of the situation and and a very um convenient path for um people who don't want to get outside of current conditions. Uh, and we do want to get outside of current conditions. So just because it could lead one down that way doesn't mean we're not going to engage with it because I think it is um, one of the most important tendencies and, and things that, that's happening right now is that like we're just producing waste. So like even if we dignify workers and all this shit, like nobody is going to... identify with producing waste like no one's going to take pride in destroying the fucking planet destroying ourselves destroying each other like it's just not fucking possible um that's what graver's doing in bullshit jobs is like there's nothing honorable in fact it is soul crushing uh when you realize that what you're doing is not just a waste of your own time outside of the fact that at least it gets you some money. Um, it's actually wasting everyone's time. Like that was for me the biggest problem with a sales job, which I always avoided doing, but I had one uh, when right after COVID, I couldn't get a job. And so I ended up doing this door to door gig until it crushed my soul too much to continue because it really is trying to sell people on stuff they don't need. I hate that. And so I don't know, man. I, I guess if I step back and really think about it, a lot of the other jobs where I thought I was doing socially necessary labor, um, in a sense, it was necessary to say GDP. In a sense, it was necessary to the status quo. But in no way, shape, or form was it actually necessary, except unless we think about something like construction um, or food, food distribution. But even then, the way that that is structured is wrong because the the everything I was doing in construction wasn't to build people utilitarian, useful homes that they can also furnish and make nice to their own custom needs. No, it was outlandishly fancy places versus fucking uh, Hong Kong esque fucking little uh, bullshit apartments, and what? it's like at that those. The blueprints we're working with and the whole sense of like the kinds of regulations we need to follow and all of it is built. It, it all presupposes a society built around the production of immense amounts of waste. Yeah. That is quite clear. Consumption is subordinated to production. It must supply the outlets required by production and, and express needs corresponding to the output, output which technological change makes most profitable at any given moment. All of this is indispensable if society is to perpetuate itself, if its hierarchical inequalities are to be reproduced and its mechanisms of domination are to remain intact. The consumer forecasts which guide economic activity are always based on the hypothesis that there will be no major change in society, lifestyles, or the forms of production and consumption. The rich and the poor will always be there, just as there will always be people who command and people who obey, or crowded underground stations in half-empty concords. We will always be in a hurry and never have sufficient time or inclination for autonomous activities. We will never have any desire or capacity to think about our needs, to debate the best means of satisfying them, and to choose corresponding collective options through a sovereign act. The idea that production and consumption can be decided on the basis of needs is, by implication, politically subversive. 
It suggests that producers and consumers could meet, discuss matters, and make sovereign decisions. It presupposes the abolition of a monopoly exercised by capital and or the state over decisions concerning investment, production, and innovation. It presupposes a consensus about the nature and level of consumption to which everyone should be entitled, and hence about the limits that should not be crossed. Finally, it presupposes a f I want to read the foot. What's the footnote about? Uh, it's just some poll, whatever. Finally, it, pres it presupposes a form of economic management designed to satisfy a maximum of needs with the greatest possible efficiency, that is to say, with the minimum of labor, capital, and natural resources, the minimum of commodity production. Now, such goals constitute a radical negation of the logic of capitalism. The option of maximum efficiency and minimum waste is so foreign to the rationality of the system that macroeconomic theory does not even possess the tools with which to grasp it. Gains, and I, I would say that since then, they've developed a language for talking about externalities, which is still not a way of grasping it. Gains realized through more efficient management appear as losses in the national statistics, a decline in GNP and in the volume of goods and services at the disposal of the population. And then I'll have you take it after this paragraph. This serves to indicate the level of distortion built into official methods of accounting and forecasting. They present any growth in output and purchasing as a rise in national wealth, even if it includes the growing quantity of throwaway packaging, gadgets, and metal thrown on the refuse tips, paper burnt along with rubbish, non-repairable household goods. It even includes artificial limbs and medical care required by victims of industrial or road accidents. Destruction officially appears as a source of wealth since the replacement of everything broken, thrown out, or lost gives rise to new production, sales, monetary flows, and profits. The more quickly things are broken, worn out, made obsolete, or thrown away, the larger the GMP will be, and the wealthier the national statistics will say we are. Even illness and physical injury are presented as sources of wealth, for they swell the consumption of drugs and healthcare facilities. But what if the opposite were the case? If good health made it possible to reduce medical expenditure, if the things we use were to last half a lifetime without becoming obsolete or worn out, if they could be repaired or even adapted without recourse to specialized paid services, then GNP would of course decline. We would work fewer hours, consume less, and have fewer needs. How does one replace an economic system based on the quest for minimum waste? The question is over a century old. It amounts to asking how an economy in which production is subordinated to capital's need for profits may be replaced by an economy, originally known as socialism, in which production is subordinated to the needs, and in which needs are freely determined by people themselves in the light of the means and costs of their possible satisfaction. Only a mode of production divested of the drive to accumulate and expand can invest today in order to save tomorrow, that is to say, in order to satisfy every type of need with a smaller volume of more durable products upon which profits, as now understood, will also be lower. Whereas the Im impossible chimera of perpetual growth is experienced as crisis and falling living standards, shrinking local produ social production will under post-industrial socialism, result from a conscious discussion to do more and live better with less. This is the essence of its superiority over capitalism. And that, I think, do more, uh, live better with less. I think that's where you could kind of do this turn into just degrowth and minimalism that itself is nothing but like a consumer choice um, that kind of reifies the, the the possible options on offer. Um, that's not it. That's not what the fuck we're talking about. Like we're, we're talking about structures. We're talking about the logic of markets versus the logic of human life, undeniable human life, time, energy, like these, right, 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 right. um, it's not just about like consumer side activism. 
which we all know is bullshit. If you if you're here and you think consumer fight at consumer side activism is efficacious, then you're in the wrong fucking spot. Or you're here to learn. So right. I like I it, like um we no, no, this is this is this is not what he's talking about. And we know this because he's talking about like for instance maker spaces everyone should have access to maker spaces right now maker spaces are privatized the point is is that you should be able to have access to them uh someone like me in poland growing up like it's not uncommon for a community to have a maker space convivial okay. spaces convivial tools convivial spaces you've got saws you've got drills you've got paint you've got this that the other and People are able to use them. He said that people like had access to instruments. Okay, we should be able to go down to the library and use a violin, and it should be a good fucking violin. You shouldn't have to own it, right? And then if you if you become a master violinist or if you're traveling or whatever, then we can. It, there can be a whole political debate over whether you have to buy one somehow or if they, you have to achieve something to be able to have ownership over one or if you just can take a rental out or however it works. It doesn't matter. The point, let people have those arguments. The basic idea of makerspaces is sound. It's sound. Not everybody needs their own uh washer and dryer not everybody needs their own lawnmower this is not austerity this is not some kind of like cold like oh working class people you need to desire less no it's just you need to desire being a musician being a thinker being a poet being a whatever being a and human as opposed to a just human. a consumer as opposed to just a statistic right. as opposed to just a piece of machinery like Freedom is this that's going on here and going on here. It's not the objects that I can consume and the objects that I'm forced to fucking produce. It's none of this shit. It's all here. And by, right. by completely throwing this and this away in favor of more consumer, more commodities, more products, more objects, you've internalized the fucking logic of capital and you're wrong. Why? Why is it wigging out? Like, hold on. Because I I it's scrolled scrolling. the I scrolled the wheel when I picked up okay. my thing. All right, it was, it was it was freaking me out. I thought there's some lemurs in the <laughs> gears. Goddamn ghost. Um, but no, I mean with the with the way my computer has been acting. Yeah. Dude. Now, uh, I guess we said it all. I don't need to go on further, but I do want to just bring it back to time energy by saying that that is the point of time energy theory is to help us desire better, mm. to make us realize that the things people desire as consumers who spend their entire jo lives around a job, you know, jobs, jobs in a job centric society, um, that those desires are based off of what, of, of, of a structurally stultified horizon of possibilities. And so you're thinking, oh, well, I could go to the movies, I could scroll on my phone, I could binge this or that, play this game. Okay, these are all the kind, the kind of consumer activities that are useful only for garbage time. But if we actually have time energy, large energy infused, repeatable blocks of time throughout the week, month, year, when you have that, the, what it affords is an expansion of the horizon of possibilities into those domains that have always been called liberating. They've always been considered uh, the liberating arts and that those liberating arts are not just the special domain of geniuses like Galileo, Bacon, Descartes, uh, I don't know, Da Vinci. No, these, these are domains that you cannot properly it, find fulfillment in, even as a consumer, if you don't understand the basics of how to do them yourself. Which is like, yeah, you can't appreciate the opera or the theater or any of these like higher, you know, aristocratic kinds of arts unless you've put a lot of disposable time into a basic acquaintance with the field, with an understanding of like why people do things a certain way. If you haven't tried your hand, your own hand at musicianship or acting, and so it's like, 
liberal arts require participation at a level that structurally stultified time energy lacking people are not able to get anything from. I'm not able to get anything from them either. Like I, classical music does virtually nothing for me. Most poetry does virtually nothing for me. And it's because I just haven't put the effort into actually getting oriented in these domains. There is knowledge lacking that would make it contextualized, that would give me some extra enjoyment that's not there. The point is, is a time energy oriented society can consume more and better. It's just less consumptive of actual waste producing bullshit. Yeah. That's, that's, I think, our statement on it. It should be clipped and shipped on its own. Yeah. That right there is our statement on it as far as where your theory of ca of what we produce for real is waste and time energy and how they go together. And it's not degrowth. And then the one thing I would say to degrowth people, because I know I've had people in the chat, oh, hey, you got to look into degrowth. Um, I feel the same way about it that I do about anti-work. There's something there. Mm -hmm. I don't like its point of emphasis. Its point of emphasis comes from um, an insufficient grasp of the situation and from a hypostitional uh, strategy forward. And I just think that you can take the baby and throw out the bathwater. You don't actually have to get, you know, set up your camp in the degrowth world or in the anti-work world. But I'm more anti-anti-work and I'm more anti degrowth anti anti degrowth than i am actually anti other of those things because there's a baby in those bathwaters yeah for sure all right take it away in fact the term post industrial socialism is inappropriate here marxist terminology would have us refer straightforwardly to communism meaning that stage in which the fullest development of the productive forces has been realized and where the principal task is no longer to maximize production or assure full employment but to achieve a different organization of the economy so that a full day's work is no longer a precondition for the right to a full income. To put it another way, it is a society in which everyone is entitled to the satisfaction of his or her needs in return for an amount of socially necessary labor occupying only a small fraction of a lifetime. We have almost reached that stage. The complete satisfaction of every need through a small amount of labor is now impeded not by insufficient development of the means of production, but rather by their overdevelopment. The system has not been able to grow and reproduce itself by accelerating the destruction as well as the production of commodities, by organizing new scarcities as the mass of wealth has increased, by devaluing wealth when it threatens to become available to all, by perpetuating poverty alongside privilege and frustration alongside opulence. The development of the productive forces within the framework of capitalism will never lead to the threshold of communism. For the very nature of its products, technology, and relations of production precludes any lasting and equitable satisfaction of needs, as well as any stabilization of social production at a commonly acceptable level of sufficiency. The very idea that there might one day be enough for all, and that the quest for more and better might give way to extra economic non-market goals and values is alien to capitalist society. It is, however, essential to communism. And communism can take shape as the positive negation of the existing system only if the ideas of self-limitation, stabilization, equity, and non-monetary exchange are given practical illustration. If, in other words, it is practically demonstrated not only that it is possible to live better by working differently and consuming less, but that voluntary collective limitation of the sphere of necessity is the way and the only way to guarantee an extension of the sphere of autonomy. Hence the importance of social experiments with new ways of living together, consuming, producing, and cooperating. Hence also the importance of alternative technologies which make it possible to do more, better, and with less, while at the same time increasing the autonomy of individuals and local communities. The fact that these technologies have mainly been developed by militant groups as indispensable tools for a different model of society does not mean, however, that they can achieve their objectives on the margin of politics, or that they prefigure a society in which the state will have been abolished through the transfer of all its functions to self-governing communities. If the time spent by individuals in producing necessities is to be reduced to a minimum, together with their dependence on the vagaries of local circumstance, 
then the socialization of the production of necessities and centralized regulation of distribution and exchange will remain essential. The sphere of necessity, and with it, the amount of time involved in socially necessary labor, can only be reduced to a minimum by the most efficient coordination and regulation of stocks and flows, or, in other words, by finely geared planning. If each individual is to be guaranteed a lifelong social income in return for 20,000 hours of socially useful work, supplied in any number of fractions, continuously or discontinuously, in one or several sectors of activity, then this can only be achieved by means of a centralized mechanism of regulation and adjustment, in other words, a state. The alternative to the present system is therefore neither a return to household economy and village autarky, nor total planning and socialization of every activity. Instead, it consists in reducing what is necessarily to be done, whether enjoyable or not, to a minimum of each person's lifetime, and in extending as far as possible collective and or individual autonomous activity seen as an end in itself. It is essential to reject both the assumption of complete state responsibility for the individual and the internalization by each individual of responsibility for the necessities intrinsic to the operation of society as a material system, identification of the individual with the state, and of the requirements of the state with individual happiness, are the two faces of totalitarianism. Nice. As Marx indicated at the end of Volume 3 of Capital, the sphere of necessity cannot be merged with the sphere of autonomy. By the way, Tut tried to say that this was just a Hegelian thing. Um, and I, I said it's 2,500 years of the conception of freedom. Everyone in the aristocracy has always known that freedom is outside of necessity. And then he was like, yeah, but it is like this sort of Hegelian thing. And it's like, yeah, but it's also this Marxian, Marxian thing. Like Marx, Marx's entire project doesn't make a, a lick of sense outside of this basic idea. Um, and if you want to know the quote he's referring to at the end of volume three, um, it is – up above. It's prior. I hope someone timestamps it in the comments. This is why an extension of the latter presuppose the latter being autonomy presupposes a clear delimitation and codification of the former necessity, right? So a delimitation and codification of necessity means put it over here so you can free up autonomy because otherwise it will dominate. It will dominate and take away all autonomy that anybody could possibly have. These are, in essence, political tasks. All right. And the other thing is that he doesn't have a problem with leadership in spaces of heteronomy. He thinks that there is a, a strong case to be made for merit-based, uh, skill-based leadership. It just needs to be in the realm of heteronomy, and that needs to be delimited and codified. That's not the same as being anti-leadership. That's why he's not responsible for this new left tendency that Tut was talking about. Politics is not about the exercise of power. Its function is to equip the state with the tasks and forms of management best able to reduce the sphere of heteronomy and enlarge the sphere, the sphere of autonomy. And this uh, is based off his novel conception of politics, what he wants politics to be about, what he's saying it really needs to be about. Um, and uh, that's obviously not the way it plays out. So it could be, maybe. But politics has no purchase or specific reality unless society itself is permeated by movements of social struggle that seek to capture broader spaces of autonomy from capitalist and state domination. By rejecting movements from capitalist and state, by rejecting movements of struggle, or by subordinating them to their present or future exercise of state power, political parties have entered into decline. Out of an anxiety to preserve their own monopoly, they now try to prevent the rebirth of politics in different forms and on different ground. As a result, they are in, they are in even greater disrepute. There can be no cause for rejoicing in their suicide. The death of politics heralds the birth of the total state. Dun, dun, dun. The appendices in this book are also 
in other books that he has done, they are the more empirical, like how, what would it look like, example-based kind of things. Um, and they're definitely worthwhile. We do not have time today. We should come back to them. Um, I would really like to come back to them within the next week or two. And I think that they could be almost standalones. Uh, they're definitely things that people should read. Like this has all been theory. Um, some people really want to see examples of things. That's what an appendix, an appendix is for. So anyway, um, definitely go check out the appendix on your own. Highly recommend. Not saying you should get this book off of Library Genesis or some other place where you can get it for free. Definitely spend money on it or whatever. Um, I'm sure that Gores isn't the one getting money if you buy it at this point, but you know, whatever. Get it legally. What else do we want to say? Anything else? Yeah, I... Look, Gores is definitely not right about everything. And in fact, he's definitely wrong about a lot. But the things that he points out where, I mean, he is talking about this productivism that is leading us all off a of fucking cliff like we're a bunch of suicidal lemmings. Um, and and trying to celebrate that is 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 wrong. And you can't, Like, you can't deny that. Um, it, the way he deals with the, the PMC that has, that has already been de-skilled, like they had this rapid ascension, and now they themselves are facing similar conditions to the precariat. Um, you know, the, the fear of falling is, is not just fear of uh, losing prestige, but in a lot of cases, it is a fear of of uh, destitution itself because it, like all of us are in um, a similar condition, and I, there's just there's a lot here that that needs to be reckoned with. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I it, Tut was like, oh, you guys are Gore's heads, like, yeah, sure, but also no, I am mainly concerned with the arguments that he's putting forward. And the conditions that he is highlighting that seem to not matter to so many people. Um, so, I mean, sure, in, in a sense, Gore's heads, but also, no, I don't give a shit about Gore's. I, I give a shit about these few things that matter. Um, and yeah, get, get rid of the rest. I don't give a shit. Um, and I'm not here to play it's with... Just least... like, like, the slippery slope. Like, yeah, sure, that's there, but also, like, um, we're, we're not cruising down the, that slippery slope, so we don't need to engage with those arguments. Like, it's it just, like, it's, it's very, right. it's, it's, it's superficial, um, it's a, it's a facsimile of an argument, um, and it just, it sucks. Um, that's what we're trying to break out of by doing this, by engaging with this work, because the conditions that Gores is highlighting make it, make it, Make it so that it's only possible to engage on the superficial level with these things. Like that's that's what's happening. We're trying to break out of that. Um, so don't do the very right. thing. Yeah, he says that we want to do more, better with less. Because we have less. Because we have less, and we have no choice for more. Because there is no more for us to have. We have to make it ourselves, and we can't make it ourselves when we're robots making shit emoji stuffed animals to, to destroy the fucking planet. Yeah. And look, I'm fine with this. Look, at a certain level, we inherently expropriate and exploit. We are inherently parasites. We are, and like, I get that there's this whole tendency on the left that just thinks, no, man, the natives didn't. All you got to do is sing a special song when you kill an animal. All you got to do is have a special prayer in your heart when you cut a tree down. All you got to do is do a sacred dance. I don't give a fuck. All right? Burn the bitch down. Fucking set the whole planet ablaze. I will eat pizza. 
You will not take away my air conditioning. I want the internet. I will not have that taken. Oh, you're colonizers. Okay, deal with it. But that's not necessary, right? It's not necessary. Uh, it. This is, I believe, I believe that this is a false dichotomy yeah. that we're given. What well, on the one side, it's like, no, we should all live under thatch roofs, you know, and 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 like forage for our berries and go to the farmers market. And the other side is like, you get to have air conditioning, internet, and then go to space in the future. Okay, well, if this if the going to space in the future reality means we leave this planet a sack of ruins and radioactive trash, I'm on board i just don't think it has to come to that because i do believe technology as we know it is as he says here a result of every invention being bent towards the dictates of capital and the profit motive and that's why it's so wasteful and that's why we have so many desires for bullshit that will not be fulfilling and that doesn't actually help us become anything interesting or fun smart talented whatever no kind of sophistication is actually possible outside of what kind of pop cultural knowledge you have in your niche consumer groups um there's a way out of that time energy theory is supposed to pave a way beyond that um but the idea that uh that that what gores is doing here is reducible to degrowth or austerity it's like no man that's not that's not what the politics of time is about yeah he's talking about the politics of time yeah because capital capital is offering us austerity and looking at things in this way is 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 an attempt at structurally theorizing a way to have more to not to not fall back into austerity. If we continue things as they are operating, we will fall into austerity. While billions of motherfuckers in the third world simply die away as robots become cheaper for uh, types of labor to support this world that we're all living in now. Like that is the, fu that, those are the stakes. That's the stakes, right. That's the stakes. And the idea that just like, it's, it, it's always about the point of emphasis. It's like, I agree. Anti-work takes the wrong point of emphasis. But anti-degrowth also takes the wrong point of emphasis. Degrowth also takes the wrong point of emphasis. It, so, and that's, Anne asked uh, on tour. She was thinking about it. She was like, so, would a time energy centric society mean that we stop being so wasteful? And our answer was like a resounding yes, which is why we don't do this whole like really taking degrowth thing seriously. Like, like, yeah, we can, we can honor the basic idea, which we just did, but a time energy society is a society in which people practice multiple languages instruments writing styles forms of communication dance theater as a normal part of their week to week and if you're like i don't even like any of that well first of all fuck you don't give a shit about you i hope you die uh second of all you can still play tetris bro or world of warcraft or whatever the fuck go on I don't give a shit, keep doing it, but human beings need to be able to be enmeshed in civic infrastructure that enables them to be able to explore their talents, develop their skills, build relationships, and organize cooperatively outside of the dictates of the profit motive or a total state that thinks that all of everything is production and therefore all of everything should be managed. Gors is the thinker of of that which is it's not that we're gore's heads it's that we're realizing we've been cheated because we've been on this thing where it's like uh all of the stuff that we thought was the case isn't the case 
and we're still trying to figure out what's going on and what our situation is. And most of the things that we've been saying that we feel like we've more or less come to on our own or by bringing together various disparate threads of all these various thinkers, a lot of it is actually right here in Gore's in the same way that it is right there in Byung-Chul Han, except that Byung-Chul Han is a lot more conservative in the sense that he doesn't have a real way forward. Yeah, and he's, yeah. He have a way forward with Gore's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, all, all this stuff um, really does play well in concert with each other as far as Byung-Chul Han um, and Gore's and Todd McGowan and, and like all, all these things really go well together. Um, we have to develop our, our palette, I guess, um, as, as thinkers and maybe consumers of theory. Um, because what we have been given is bullshit. And for us to take the stance of, of a resolute, no, I don't accept this. There is a way forward. There is something better. Um, Yeah, I, I, I think that's necessary and I love it and I love everyone who's who's involved, uh, who's involved in it collectively and, and uh, collaboratively. And. Uh, yeah. I, I do love everybody in it. and I just want to say, like, I know. Next time I get canceled, someone's going to clip that shit I said earlier. Fuck em. <laughs> like. like my colonizer realism. Look, no amount of saying some sacred thing or getting back in touch with mother nature changes that at the at at bottom, we do have to act on nature and also defend ourselves from nature. That nature's not just our friend. It's not just our loving mommy. Um, it's also a cold, um, uncaring thing. And that, yeah, we don't want to destroy the very grounds of our being, right? And we don't want to uh, throw out the responsibility unique to humans of finding ourselves conscious on this place and realizing we're stewards for this or we're exploiters. And that's why I love The Unsettling of America by Wendell Berry, mainly the first few chapters before he gets into the Christian stuff. Really, for me, it's the main, like the first few chapters. And the very beginning is this division in our hearts and between us. It's not, he says, normally people think of oppressed versus oppressors. And he says, that's a problem because there are oppressors in the oppressed groups. And then you give the oppressed groups power, they become oppressors. Look at Israel, come on. And so the point is, is that through our hearts, every human being has the capacities to do nurture, to be nurturant. And on the other side has the capacities to exploit. Is this a system that cultivates our nurturant or exploitative tendencies? I don't care if you call it productive or growth or degrowth or what. The question is, are the tools we're using manipulative tools or are they convivial tools? Are the tools we're using cultivating us as self-empowered and able to actually have something to offer back and cooperate with other people? Or is it making us instruments of mass scale manipulation, exploitation, expropriation, right? This is the stakes. And nurture is traditionally cross-culturally uh, monopolized or at least overrepresented by women or feminine aspects of our nature. We all have it in us. Men too, believe it or not, actually have it. Um, but the current gender discourse wants to make being a woman into being a catty fucking uh uh, not Cardi B, what's the name I'm looking for? Uh, Kim K. It makes you into a Kim K. Like this is what is being performed for us as what a woman is supposed to be. And what's being forgotten is that there is always this strong tendency in feminism for saying, no, it's about nurture. And what we see people who are performing femininity today, when they perform it, they're performing an aesthetic. They're not performing nurture. Yeah, they the aren't nurturing coquettishness. us. It's coquettishness. And of course, for the for the Betty Friedans of the world, there is nothing else but coquettishness beneath the the guys, the performance. Um, but 
well, women do have a tendency to be a bit more um, within the uh, balance of the reality principle and nurture. And of course, men, there can be special men who have a, an attunement to that. Um, but the point is, is when he said the future is woman, when Gore says that, he's talking about nurture. He's talking about care. And what neoliberal feminism has done with those ideas is literally throw them out and say that that's some essentialist ideas used to keep women down. Yeah. All right. The point is, is that we should all be becoming more nurturant. Um, and what we are actually seeing on the ground is, and this is what I would actually say to Gores if I saw him giving this presentation talking about the future as women, is I would say, but the women aren't even women anymore. He kind of gets at that. But the point is, is like women are increasingly um, not girl bosses, man. They're miniature Trumps. OK, don't call it girl boss because that's like almost like you could dignify girl bosses, boss them like. There's a good there's a good connotation to the word boss, um, but no this this uh, this girl Trump shit is is what we're getting and it's coquettish and it's it's flirty and it's non-committal and it's self empowered and blah 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 it's super individualistic um, it's completely cut off from nurture and everything it does presupposes a world exploited presupposes your bubble of privileged uh, relative time energy and especially consumer. Uh, choices off the backs of billions of people, off the backs of billions of people. And so I want to close this out by reading the quote I have up on the screen here, which is, um, could you stop screen sharing so I can start screen sharing? I want to show the quote I pulled up. Folks, this is the quote that we alluded to. Uh, if you were here for the entirety of the Gore's reading, then you already know it because it is the quote from the end of Capital Volume 3, which really, I think, drives home the point that there's this aspect of Marx's project that is the most important aspect that Gores has not lost touch with. And the rest of anybody who thinks that there's anything of value in Marx needs to come to terms with and reintegrate. So here we go. I will read the, his preamble to the actual quote where he says, Marx already envisaged that at the end of volume three of Capital, when he described how the sphere of freedom or autonomy would only begin beyond a sphere of necessity or heteronomy that could be reduced, but never entirely eliminated by recognizing its inevitability, not by not, but not by denying its existence. Will it be possible to reduce its importance as much as possible? And as a result, ensure that its logic does not dominate every type of individual activity. So here's the quote. In fact, the realm of freedom actually begins only where labor, which is determined by necessity and mundane considerations, ceases. Thus, in the nature of things, it lies beyond the sphere of actual material production, just as the savage must wrestle with nature to satisfy his wants, to maintain and reproduce life, so must civilized man. And he must do so in all social formations and under all possible modes of production. With his develop so all possible modes of production, you have to deal with necessary labor. Duh. With his development, this realm of physical necessity expands as a result of his wants. But at the same time, the forces of production which satisfy these needs also develop. Freedom in this field can only consist in socialized man the associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control, instead of being ruled by it as by the blind forces of nature, and achieving this with the least expenditure of energy and under conditions most favorable to and worthy of their human nature. But it nonetheless remains a realm of necessity. Beyond it begins that development of human energy, which is an end in itself, the true realm of freedom, which, however, can blossom forth only with this realm of necessity as its basis. The shortening of the working day is its basic prerequisite. You want that in plain speech and with a bit more of an existential uh, twist on it, you got to read the Time Energy book. Subtitle is Why You Have No Time or Energy. It's by me, David McCarricker. It was published this year by Theory Underground. Um, it is 
what this is all ultimately about. And now I'm actually going to turn this into, as Descartes did in his discourse on method, a uh, call for patronage, because I understand what he understood, which is what every intellectual has always known, Marx included, which is that research requires freedom from preoccupation with necessity. For the time being, money is the thing necessary for freeing up researchers from the sphere of necessity. And so um, my computer is broken. My laptop is actually making this terrible, terrible sound. Um, it's here. I'll, I'll play it for you all. Can you hear that? Yeah. It, it's it, kind of. It sounds demonic. So, yeah, Zoom was canceling that sound out throughout the last couple of days, but that is what's going on. And this, the, there are a variety of issues with this computer. And so my, um, my guy who does salvaging work and sets me up with uh, things at a huge discount because he salvages trashed computers um, is going to help me. But the point is, is that I just moved into a new place. I've got all kinds of new bills. This is the first month that students in the United States have to start paying back student debt. I did go $60,000 into debt while working and while getting pretty awesome scholarships. Um, I had the president's scholarship. I had the dean's scholarship at one point. I had a variety of other scholarships. I still had to go into debt because you can't work full time and get A's. And I cared about taking my classes seriously and not just getting C's to get degrees or whatever. Um, and ult ultimately, all of that has built up into what I'm now doing. This is not something that I can do forever unless it can bring in more money. But I also don't want to ever have the need to bring in more money hijack what I'm actually doing, right? Um, so I'm quite, ha I'm quite happy to work part-time elsewhere as a way of balancing things so that I don't need to bring in so much money at Theory Underground. Um, because if if all of my income had to come from there, I think it could really ruin the whole thing going on here. But basically, I've had no more than three patrons this year. Three. I've gotten a couple one-off donations. A couple people who felt some gratitude gave me 50 bucks here or there through PayPal or Venmo. But I've had three patrons this year. Nance is one of them. The, the biggest thing Nance has given us um, is his time energy and his genuine dedication. And that matters more than the money. Um, but three patrons is not a lot. Um, there are people who are still barking up the wrong trees uh, and reproducing old scripts and selling you that they have the solutions and they're not doing genuine thinking. And they're definitely not assuming a working class with earbuds who wants to learn how to read for itself, who wants to gain a general education in the liberating arts, much less in philosophy and theory that would read across the old and new left and outside of that, those two domains. Um, no one else is doing this. Um, but I do want to give Nance a moment to say something. You've given some money. So why, why do you do it? Try to try to help sell somebody on the idea of maybe someday um, actually helping in this situation. Cause I need a new computer and, or at least I need to get this one fixed and I need to get a whole bunch of other stuff in here, but for now I'm living out of boxes. So yeah. What, what would you say? I think there are people and they probably spend the majority of their time seeking on the internet because the internet is just the place where one seeks nowadays. There's, there's no more, uh, commons in the real world into which we can go and, and kind of discover new things and seek out human experience and shit. So there are a lot of people, first of all, there are a lot of people on the internet in general. There are a lot of people on the internet just doing the thing, just masturbating essentially, being assholes, um, and ultimately celebrating their own slow suicide. But then there's a super small cat subcategory of people on the internet who genuinely give a fuck um, and, and are over it. Um, and so they seek out theory and philosophy and, uh, and leftism or socialism or, or even reactionary shit. They, you know, they, they lean into nationalisms because they have nothing else. Whatever the fuck it is, 
um, we're all looking for something. And for the people who, who are fully invested in, in, in the search, um, but who are also fully over everything that's on offer, Theory Underground um, is a space where we can come together and there is an element of commiserating and there is an element of fucking in-group, out-group and um, just shooting the shit and hanging out. That's all there, but that's all kind of anywhere. You can create that anywhere. Um, Theory Underground really truly is a space kind of dedicated to figuring out these human futures um, that, uh, that are essential because we're on a goddamn collision course with catastrophe. We truly are. Um, and we, we need this space of thought and investigation and tarrying with the negative, tarrying with, with difficult things and truly trying to figure this shit out. Um, I would, I would have loved to have gone to university. I mean, I like long story about that, but like, Theory Underground is a space where you can like tickle your fancy, but also like do the thing that is ostensibly being done in, in, in the halls of academia. Um, but that's not actually getting done. It necessarily has to happen in these outside bootstrapped places. Um, so if you have the fucking means, I mean, if you're here in the first place, you're probably inclined. So if you have the means, um, pitch in. Or start your own goddamn project. One or the other. But don't sit on the fucking sidelines. Like this is uh, one of the very few times where, where silence is actually violence. Where inactivity is, um, is complicity. I do believe that. I do believe we have to fucking jump in and get our hands dirty. Um, and you have created a space where, where that is being done. So that's why I, that's why I'm so like, I, I love it and I'm committed to it um, because it's, it's satisfying that part of me that is just will never be satisfied. Yeah. I think something I learned from the tour, people came to the events and there's probably two kinds of people. There's probably more than two kinds, but there's probably at least two kinds of people. They come to the event expecting it to be bigger and then realize, oh, this is cool, man. If it wasn't for me, there'd be no one here. Or like the whole presentation would have been fundamentally different. It actually, I am a contributing member of what came out of this space, out of this event, versus the other kind of person who shows up is like, oh, it's garbage because there weren't a lot of people here. There's a third kind, of course, like just a hipster who thinks it's cool because you're in the thing before it catches on. Um, if you want to be able to say, oh, yeah, I was into Theory Underground before it was cool. Um, it's too late, dude. Fucking Nance already beat you to it like a year ago. Um, if you want to say, oh, I was there with Theory, Theory Plebe and now I've been watching Theory Underground. It's like, yeah, but if you haven't been doing these readings, you haven't been doing these exegeticals, you haven't been doing these B-sides, you haven't been doing these courses, you haven't been, then you can't even say you were a part of it. Like, you got to actually be involved. You can't sit on the sidelines. And the that's what being there in person makes you realize is that when you stop being in the sidelines and you become a contributing member, it actually has a qualitative di qualitative dif dis difference on everything and that's kind of the idea of underground shit is that you go to people where they're at but you go to the people who are into it you go to the people who get it and you say and as long as the people get it we don't need anybody else right and then people say well how's that gonna foster a mass movement how's that gonna make this go to the man if you didn't go check out the shit we already said to tut like we are already kind of post mass society um when 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 baudrillard says that the mass era or the mass age is the the message what he's saying is 
we are never going to be able to do the multitude thing that Hart and Negri think we can do. We cannot understand people on the basis of their class standing. We cannot understand people on the basis of their marginalized group identity. We cannot understand people on the basis of anything except for actually having conversations with real people and not people who just see themselves as categories. And uh, this, this whole like, oh, but how do we make that mass communicable? has been the dead end against which every brain has rotted for the last 150 years of worker struggle. There needs to be spaces for people who want to be leaders, uh, who want to be artists, who want to be activists, but don't want to be cringe, who want to have a basis in the actual situation and not just recycled old slogans and big feels. Okay. So, you know, this, this, we're moving into a new era with Theory Underground. 2024 is what we are vamping up towards. We've alluded to it earlier already that there's going to be something new. There are tiers of involvement that you can sign up for at the Theory Underground app, which is buggy and shit, but you can still get on it. It still works enough to get on it and get those tiers of involvement. There's also ways of, of supporting, like getting into the courses, uh, purchasing the books. Um, and ultimately, my model assumes the niche of the niche of the niche. My model assumes not the masses, but the niche of the niche of the niche from the masses who want to do this as a lifestyle, who want not just to be the smartest person in the room, but so as to defend regular working people who are structurally stultified and to defend them from virtue hoarding PMCs and people who are worldview salesmen telling you they have all of the solutions when they don't. To defend working people from them, to dignify those sentiments um, in all kinds of these various strains, because there are little grains of truth in everything, but then to direct it and take it forward and go do something better. And that's not going to be possible for any leaders, if the leaders do not allow themselves to go deeper because they're holding themselves back to a standard of the rank and file, you have to go above and beyond if you want to be a part of an intellectual vanguard. And that intellectual vanguard, if it's going to have anything genuine to it, cannot be reducible to any platform, to any party, to any movement. It has to be its own thing. And that would be an intellectual milieu that comes out of the actual situation we are in. And the actual situation we are in is not something anybody's really figured out except at the level of the scene. And most of the people who are big figures or considered intellectuals on this scene are really good at telling you who this person is or who that person is because they'll tell you what that person's culpable in or responsible for or participated. It's never engagement with concepts. It's never engagement with the actual analyses. And that's because they've already got niche consumer demographics on lock. They've already got their thing figured out. We don't have it figured out. We're here for a small band of people who know that we don't have it figured out. That doesn't sell well. It doesn't sell well. All I need is something like, I'm like looking down at my note here. I wrote 50 people. If I had 50 people making between $10 and $300 per month donations, or paying for the subscriber tiers between $30 and $300. If I had 50 people doing it, I would be able to do this full time. I wouldn't even have to worry about anything else. And I would do this full time, five days a week, hub events. And by participating, your, your circumspective, as Heidegger would say, your circumspective awareness is going to become this referential totality of different languages, different theorists, and different concepts and texts and the expectancy is that you're not just reading these things once, or you're not just hearing us read them. You're actually reading and rereading them, and you're doing it all with this ultimate goal of revolutionizing the concepts people operate with and the vision of society that people have in mind. Because without that, there's no hope from below or above, right? It has, it has to come from there. And any and all political agendas, movements, organizations are destined to failure if they're not theoretically literate on the current situation. And we're not. We're working on it. We're trying to be. And in a way, I think we are more advanced than anything else on the scene right now because we, we recognize that it is a scene, 
but we're trying to go above and beyond a scene into an actual working class intellectual milieu. One that's even quite fine with saying maybe we maybe we aren't the solution. Maybe the solution doesn't come from us. Maybe workers really don't have what it takes. Maybe working class identity politics really is just this dead end. Maybe we actually need other people from all walks of life to get in on board with this. And and we don't know. We're trying to figure it out. And we think that we're we're reading a lot of people together that only get read in isolation or not at all. And Andre Gores is a perfect example of one of these people that's not read at all, not by any of the existing theory orgs. Tut will say something like he's important to engage with him, but where are people engaging with him? Nowhere. It doesn't exist yet, right? And so I don't know. It's a special little space that we have opened up, but it's only through three patrons and my own savings from Amazon last year that are officially spent. Also for my tiny house that I sold off that are officially spent. I have 150 bucks in my checking account and that's it right now. And I go, I go to work at Amazon next week. That's the situation. My computers are broken. I'm officially back to paycheck to paycheck. Uh, but my my Amazon schedule is two days a week and uh, – no, sorry, four days a week, four hours per day, starting early morning, 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., and then I'll be doing hubs each of those days. And so my point is that I think I can make Theory Underground work doing part-time at Amazon and putting a 100 times more of my energy and effort – into theory underground than anyone else is going to be able to capable be capable to do for a long time and that if i can continue to do that for even just a year i think the things that are going to come from it are going to be so much more than anybody's imagining but we i mean why am i still talking about this at the end of this giant video it's because if you got to the end of this giant video then you probably get some kind of value from what we're doing that is not being done by anyone else. And one thing that I hate is when people who don't really watch me just lump me up with all of these other people and think that I'm some smaller version of these people who are ultimately either old or new left influencers. All right. Um, we're trying to do something that's not been done. Like um, it's an educational space, man. And it's not one that is explicitly leftist. It's one that is explicitly Hell bent on doing a dialectical reading of the situation. And that means not just reading for the babies in the bathwater across the left, but also other spaces where other people like McLuhan or Heidegger or even Burnham are critical of the left. All right. The whole thing has to be understood. We have to work through it ourselves. Marx doesn't have the solution for our current situation, but we kind of have to do as he did, which is. We all have to move to England and go to the British Museum and sit down for 10 hours a day. And no, I'm just kidding. But you, you get the idea. Keep working at your job and listening to us. Keep playing video games and listening to us. Even when you don't have the ability to focus on everything we're saying, have it play in the background the way that the boomers do the news, the AM radio or the cable television networks. Do that the same way they did. Just have it on in the background because if you want to change your situation, you cannot just change the actual focus of your intentionality, of your objects of concern. You actually have to re-territorialize your circumspective awareness itself, the equipmental signifying referential totalities outside of you and around you that gives context and background and meaning to whatever it is that you're foregrounding. And if you're having so much trouble focusing – this is why. It's because you haven't re-territorialized that. And you can't do it with video essays. You can't do it with podcasts. You can't do it with smart people who read books. You have to get into the books yourself. But there's a way to bootstrap the process. And we're pioneering it. Yeah. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. All right. Everybody, take care. It's been awesome. Bye-bye.